This is one coming into Boston Harbor way back when before, uh, bigger than the apartment block. Um, being as how it comes so close to people in Boston Harbor, and after 9-11 it was banned for two years by the mayor, but they eventually, under special homeland security rules, let them back in. Um, they, they are very carefully guarded. Way before they get anywhere near the United States, there's Coast Guard boards them, checks the whole crew, make sure they're bona fide, and then uh, these people uh, with guns laden are uh, escorted in. Why? Uh, because uh, on the scale of the International Maritime Organization, uh, LNG is classified as, as a class two hazard, which is one down from explosives. Uh, Canada has yet to adopt the most recent IMO standards, and we are waiting for Transport Canada to do that. Uh, I think the people of Lac Megantic are also waiting for Transport Canada to do some stuff. Um, immediately after 9-11, LNG tankers were rated as the highest other hazard. Uh, they hadn't even considered the, the, the tower, Twin Towers as a possible target for terrorists, but they certainly considered LNG tankers. And uh, so the US Senate, uh, chaired by Joe Biden, the vice president, formed a special committee to look into it and hired Sandia National Laboratories, which is a government laboratory in the US, to look at what would happen if an LNG tanker spill uh, occurred near a population. Everybody thought physics, oh, um, natural gas, methane, is lighter than air, it just float off into the atmosphere. And that's the story uh, the industry would like you to believe. But Sandia said, no, that doesn't happen much. If you put a hole in the side of an LNG tanker and it's and all the way through to its to the tank you just saw, it spills out and in a watery environment, uh, it would be an uncontained spill over water. It will pick up a lot of water vapor and it will um, form a low white fog and the first ignition points it hits, it will drift with the wind, the first ignition point it hits, it will blow. Uh, more in a fireball than, a, than an explosion, like that. Uh, and it drifts over, and uh, in this case, a populated area, uh, which there are a few in now, so, and would basically hit the first malfunctioning stove, uh, light, uh, a passing ship, a passing boat, uh, cigarette, um, you name it, would set it off, and there would be a spontaneous fireball. Um, we could <coughs> happen the wrong time of the year, you'd probably trigger first fire. Um, so this would be lethal, and yet another study said, for the poor graphics that uh, estimated there are various dispersion models that different organizations use. Um, Sandia recommended something I'll show you in a minute. Um, and, but this one by an outfit called IO Oasis in Houston said no, 50% fatalities out to 3.7 kilometers, worst case. Um, so I went and chased wood fiber and said, where are you going to bunker these? Because they've got to get fuel for the trip back to China with 60,000 tons. Uh, they could burn, some of them can burn LNG, but typically that's more expensive than, than bunker fuel by quite a bit. Um, so uh, they said, no, we're not going to bunker them at the plant. We're going to, and we, after a bit more pressing, they said, there's nowhere to anchor in house sound, so we can't, they can't uh, refuel there. So then I went and chased, um, when I asked them, they said, well, they might bunker in Vancouver. Um, so I went and chased and I saw that Vancouver port has recently changed its rules, allowing um, the bunkering of LNG, uh, well, large tankers, anything over 275 meters, which pretty well all of the LNG tankers in the world are, um, off uh, West Vancouver and the other South, what's called uh, South English Bay, uh, Moorages of Point Grey, Kitsilano, and our beloved Stanley Park. Now, if you draw the three and a half kilometer Sandia zone around those, uh, there's some fairly expensive real estate involved. Um, <laughs> and all the realtors, if there are realtors here, I have a fairly long background in, in advising the real estate industry in, BC, in Canada. Um, that you aware that you have to disclose these sorts of things to prospective buyers. <laughs> now the, the Chamber of Shipping moved long, long and hard because they thought it was too much of a bother for large ta oil tankers, what they were thinking of at the time, I think, to, to go in past into the Indian arm stretch to refuel 
and they knew that it's fairly tricky and dangerous, especially in that wind off, off uh, Point Atkinson, to transfer ship to ship 3,500 to 4,000 3, 4, tons of bunker fuel. Um, and that's what would be happening. So not only is it a danger to have either t totally full LNG tankers or they're never really empty, there's always a heel left in the bottom and they're fairly dangerous in terms of explosives then. Um, to have them anchored off here uh, threatens a whole bunch of people. Um, that's what looks like it's going to happen because these things need to be refueled and if there's nowhere in house sound to refuel the tanker they're not going to pull into Dan Sewell's and say fill her up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the way they've changed the rules. I've, I've never before seen a tanker, the red one, the red one here is, is an, an oil or chemical tanker, it's called the Stolt Ocelot. It's not a huge one but I, they're really relaxing the rules in Vancouver about letting uh, tankers of any kind moor out in English Bay. Um, if you view this scene from Marine Drive, and those of you fortunate to live in that lovely place, this is what it might look like if the same aqua eye bomb visited your neighborhood. And as I said, that, that hazard zone, that if you look all the way, it goes all the way up to the upper levels highway, so you better be good at running uphill. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I would be amiss in not pointing out that in 40 years of shipping LNG around the world, mostly by majors like Petronas, Exxon, Imperial, a um, whole bunch of other people whose names are all household names, um, there has not been an accidental large-scale spill from an LNG tanker. Lots of fatalities of one kind or another, but, but an LNG tanker has not come seriously to grief. They've grounded, they've struck rocks, they've struck each other, um, but fortunately, um, not a major release. And, uh, and that's a bit of luck, but it's also the fact that there's an international organization of these people called SICTO, and the Society of International Gas Tanker and Terminal Operators, who are all the majors, who are self-insured, so they have a big vested interest in making sure nothing goes wrong. Uh, these wood fiber people are not members of SICTO and are breaking a whole pot of rules of SICTO, which include do not put, this is quote, do not put LNG plants in narrow inland waterways with significant recreational ferry and commercial traffic, um, water traffic, uh, do not do that. Well, I can't think of a more apt description for how it sounds. Um, so I don't think a, a proponent that argues that the industry has a safety record, um, when the industry earned that safety record out of applying all these standards, uh, turns around and says, well, we will we'll borrow those safety records when they're breaking the rules. Um, so um, Sandy has said, okay, we really think there are three zones, uh, they call them zones of concern, and there was a great debate over what to call them, hazard zones, risk zones, um, you're a human popsicle zone, or you're a kebab zone. Um, the, um, so they said, zone one, 500 meters each side of the transiting tanker, that's really quite lethal. Um, zone two, in which you stand, uh, a 50-50 chance of surviving in a worst case scenario uh, 1600 meters, basically a mile on either side of a transiting tanker and zone 3 is 3.5 three kilometers which is deep sunburn area um, if, if uh, this worst case thing happened. Um, and the, in the US, Homeland Security and the Coast Guard uh, use these hazard zones to do something called a waterway suitability assessment prior to allowing LNG plants to locate there and uh, tankers to use the waterway. So you don't wind up with a lot of, of uh, LNG plants in the US uh, which have uh, exits to the ocean that pass by major population centers because the US has some standards. Sadly, Canada has none. Um, but were you to apply what our Premier likes to call world leading standards, you might consider doing this. So here's what you get when you plot those three on the map of House Sound. And you can see, and each of you has, has a copy of one on your chair, what that might mean for you. 
A video has emerged of a terrifying moment a gas tanker exploded on a highway in China, killing five people and sending visible shock waves across the road. People were filmed desperately trying to escape as smoke billowed from a tanker that had overturned on the major motorway in central China's Hunan province on Saturday. After the road is engulfed in thick smoke, a massive blast rocks the highway and surrounding valley. Five people, including three firefighters, were killed in the explosion. Two fire trucks and five other vehicles were destroyed. The tanker was carrying liquefied natural gas and had leaked around 20 tons before the blast. The tanker was still burning on Sunday afternoon. Seven vehicles, including two fire trucks, were destroyed in the blast. The cause of the accident is still under investigation. <clears throat> um. Federal policy on LNG tankers. Canada doesn't have a whole pile of rules about LNG because it doesn't have a whole pile of LNG plants. It has one import plant in New Brunswick, but there are none, no plants on the west coast of either Canada or the US. There's a tiny one just started up in Kenai, Alaska, but that's 100 miles from anywhere. Um, so, uh, and it's, it's about one tenth the size of what wood fiber is proposing, which is typically one tenth the size of what um, world standard or world grade or world size LNG plants are. So this is pretty small. Um, in uh, Passamaquoddy Bay is in uh, Maine and uh, it's right next to New Brunswick. In order to have an LNG plant proposed in Maine, uh, they had to pass these LNG tankers coming in um, through Canadian waters. So uh, 1 p.m. Stephen Harper stood up in the house and said, we oppose the passage of LNG tanker traffic through Canadian waters, and we will continue to do so. When this announcement was made, it caught my attention. I just came back from Rudong in Jiangsu province near Shanghai. I saw the most incredible feat of engineering you'll find just about anywhere. The longest LNG pipeline in the world over land. It goes out about uh, almost 20 kilometers. Um, out from the shore so that they can receive LNG from around the world and that is where we are going to connect Squamish, British Columbia to China as Wood Fiber builds their facility in BC to export natural gas over here, a country that needs it very, very badly. And um, because they're doing that, they've announced that they're opening their head office in Vancouver very soon. It's an exciting day for British Columbia, another milestone in the hunt to make sure we are first in getting to the natural gas market. Briefly on economics, I think BC has missed the window of opportunity to export LNG to Asia. The supply and demand forecast because Australia is building piles and piles of plants, um, we've missed. I think we've dodged a bullet because uh, Credit Suisse recently described the Australian LNG expansion as a slow train wreck. Um, gas price has fizzled, um, it shot up after Fukushima event and is currently languishing, it shot up to almost 18 or 20 and that's when Premier Clark, I think fairly rightly, got excited about the idea that if we've got lots of gas we could make lots of money doing this. The problem is the market has turned sour and is likely, according to other factors, likely to stay there. Um, because the break-even price is about between 11 and 12 dollars and the current price is around just south of eight dollars. Uh, oil and gas would have to greatly increase to uh, compensate. Um, BC royalties haven't done so well either on, on natural gas. Uh, this rate of knots, uh, we will take 408 years to pay off BC's provincial debt. Um, there won't be any return. This was a study done by uh, the Council Centre of Policy Alternatives and said, well, even at $12 price, and remember the price is now under eight, um, it will take at least 14 years for any tax to trickle into the BC Treasury. Um, some people think these risks um, uh, outweigh the benefits. Uh, I'm one of them. Um, and I believe that the only possible sustainable energy future is renewable energy. And I'd like to leave you with a few quotes. Um, 
This is Sheikh Gamani, the Saudi oil minister, said the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And the oil age won't end, will end long before we run out of oil. And, I, and then a more Canadian um, expression was uh, in terms of energy policy, well, we can compare it to Wayne Gretzky's idea of playing hockey. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not to where it has been. Okay. Um,